Well, Dr. Curry, thank you for that um, welcome. Uh, esteemed faculty, members of the board, and student body, it's a great privilege to be here, and I'm grateful for this opportunity to come at this time and in this place and to bring the word of God uh, to bear upon you. Uh, I really, um, there's, there's, apart from having practiced medicine and um, preaching, the one common denominator between Lloyd-Jones and myself is his comment about himself that I heartily agree with about myself when he said, I wouldn't cross the road to hear myself preach. <laughs> and I often feel that. I, I listen to my own search. One of the most depressing things I ever do is listen to my own preaching and think it felt as if it came with so much more power uh, on the Lord's Day among the Lord's people. But uh, uh, God is gracious to strike a straight lick with a crooked stick as they say. So, if you would please turn with me in your copy of the Word of God to Paul's first letter to Timothy and chapter 3. And as I address you this evening on the subject of the pulpit and the pillar of truth in an age of controversy. I'm going to begin here uh, and then bounce to Ephesians 4 for, for a while and then come back, God willing, and finish here if we have time. I, I agree with John Murray when he said once, I think, that I find it very difficult to say a little about things I've thought an awful lot about, and I feel that way this evening. So my intention is to start here, go to Ephesians 4 and come back and finish here with some exhortations, especially to those of us who are called to gospel ministry. Before we read the Word of God, let's pray together, shall we? O Lord God Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, before the mountains were born, when you gave birth to the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. You turn man back to dust and say, Return, O children of men. For a thousand years in your sight are like yesterday when it passes by or like a watch in the night. And what is man, O Lord, that you should be mindful of him or the son of man, that you would take thought of him? But for a moment, O Lord, the grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of God endures forever. And we come to you this evening, O Lord, in the name of your Son, who is the living and abiding Word of God, the one who was with you in the, in the beginning, the one who is God and who was God and who always has been God, the one who's dwelt towards the Father from before the foundation of the world, the one who became flesh as he stepped from eternity into time to speak to us, O oh God, words of life, the same words that made the world, the same words that uphold the universe by the word of his power. He speaks to us this evening, O Lord, and we pray that your word would spread rapidly in this place and be glorified as I and other men preach in the tonight and tomorrow. Let we preachers, O God, let us decrease, and let Christ increase. Let not none see us, O Lord, let us fade away into the background. We're but mouthpieces, we're not worthy for the sandal strap. But grant, O Lord Jesus, that you would be seen here and felt here, with the light of the knowledge of the glory of God that shines full in your face, your head, your hair white like wool, your eyes like a blaze of fire, your feet like burnished bronze when it's been made to glow in a furnace, your voice like the sound of many waters, and your face shining like the sun in its strength. O oh Lord Jesus, come and speak to us. Forgive us our many sins. Grant, O oh Lord, that you would fill us up with all of your fullness until the day breaks and the shadows flee away. Keep us kept, especially from ourselves, from the devil and the world. Keep our eyes fixed above where you are, our life in heaven. We offer these prayers, O oh Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. If you would please take heed. This is the word of God. I hope to come to you soon. 
But I'm writing these things to you that if I delay, you may know how one ought to behave in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, a pillar and buttress of the truth. Great indeed, we confess, is the mystery of godliness. He was manifested in the flesh, vindicated by the Spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed on in the world, and taken up in glory. Now, the Spirit expressly says that in latter times, some will depart from the faith, devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and teachings of demons through the insincerity of liars whose consciences are seared, who forbid marriage and require abstinence from foods that God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. For everything created by God is good, and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving, for it's made holy by the word of God in prayer. If you put these things before the brothers, you'll be a good servant of Christ Jesus, being trained in the words of the faith and of the good doctrine that you have followed. Have nothing to do with irreverent, silly myths. Rather, train yourself for godliness, for while bodily training is of some value. Godliness is of value in every way. It holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance, for to this end we toil and strive because we have our hope set on the living God, who is the Savior of all people, especially of those who believe. Command and teach these things. Let no one despise you for your youth but set the believers an example in speech and conduct, in love and faith, in purity. Until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture, to exhortation, to teaching. Do not neglect the gift you have, which was given you by prophecy when the council of elders laid their hands on you. Practice these things. Immerse yourself then in them so that all may see your progress. Keep a close watch on yourself and on the teaching. Persist in this, for by so doing, you will save both yourself and your hearers. Well, when I was a young lad back in Northern Ireland at high school, art was compulsory, which was a problem because I'm not very artistic. But one of the particular aspects of um, art that I enjoyed was pottery. And I learned in pottery when you're throwing and throwing sometimes is the operative word, throwing clay on a, on a potter's wheel, there's nothing more important than having the clay centered on the wheel. If the clay is centered on the wheel, it's in the one place where the centrifugal forces exerted by the spinning wheel have no effect upon it. Well, it allows your fingers and thumbs to do all their magic with the clay. But if you have the clay off-center, if it's not directly in the middle of the potter's wheel, as it starts to spin, the centrifugal forces begin to do their work. And the faster uh, the maddening jar of the potter's wheel goes, the more the central uh, fugal forces control the clay, and the clay controls you. And before it's all said and done, you'll be throwing the clay all over the walls, and anyone standing close enough to be unfortunate enough to witness your incompetence as one of my elders like to say, ideas have consequences and bad ideas have victims. <laughs> now, if you take that example and go from the potter and the clay to the church and the truth, there's surely nothing more important for the church, especially in an age of conflict, than to be centered upon Christ and his truth. If we're centered on the truth of Christ and on the Christ of truth, the centrifugal forces of the world and the flesh and the devil will have no real effect upon our ministries. We'll be there in the middle place, stable and secure, in that one central still place in all the cosmos, the throne of God, where his power is unleashed for the glory of his name and the growth of his kingdom and the good of his people. But if you allow your ministry, the church you pastor, to be off-center, off, off kilter from Christ and his truth, then as the ministry starts to spin, 
and spin at will. And people start expressing their desires for what the church should be doing, their vision for its ministry and its message. And the devil begins to get into the details, and into the details he will get. The centrifugal forces will pull you and your ministry and your church to the four winds. There's nothing more important for the church than to be centered in truth. And that matters because we live in an age of controversy, an age of controversy in which all, almost all of the controversies that we see buffeting the church are half-truths told as whole truths, which end up as whole untruths, J.A. Packer said. And if the church buys into a half-truth, it'll end up offering a half a gospel and half a Savior, a half a Jesus. You offer half a Jesus as a whole Jesus, and you end up with the whole wrong Jesus, who is no Jesus at all. Everything is on the line for those foolish enough to monkey with the truth, the truth of God. And here in this passage, there's many things you could say about truth in the church, couldn't you? It's the church's foundation. We're built upon the truth of the apostles and prophets, Christ, the chief cornerstone. We're, it's the church's foundation. It's the, church's, it's the force that binds us together. As Gurnall said famously, unity without truth is no better than conspiracy. It's the food that grows us up speaking the truth in love, Paul says earlier in chapter 4 of Ephesians. We grew up in all things into Christ who is the head. But here, Paul speaks of truth in an amazing way. It's, it's his counterpredictable genius. He calls the church the pillar and buttress of the truth. You'd never expect him to say that. You'd expect him to say the truth is the pillar and buttress of the church, but he doesn't say that. The church is the pillar and buttress of the truth. What do you mean? Well, he's describing a reality you drive by every day on the interstates of America. Every few hundred yards, sometimes certainly every mile or so, you'll see a, a billboard raised up high for all to see, raised up by a brown metal common pillar whose only job is to proclaim the truth of the billboard. And that's the church. It's our function in the world. We are to hold up the truth of God, to placard the truth of God before the eyes of a watching world. And Paul's concern here is the church, the we the church, the church in Ephesus in his day and the church in our day, that we don't mess that up by allowing the, the church as the pillar to be corrupted. That our, that our, that our conduct and our, and our lack of godliness would be such an offense to the world that the world, as we, the world will say to us in offense, I, I can't hear what you're saying. Who you are is speaking too loudly. Did you notice that he speaks about the church as the pillar and, and, and buttress of the, of the truth? He flanks it fore and aft with our behavior. I'm writing this whole book, Paul says, so that you may know how one ought to behave in the household of God. And he goes immediately on to the mystery of godliness. which is another statement that's amazing. It's unguessable. What's the mystery of godliness? If I said, tell me six things about the mystery of godliness, what would you say? Well, the predictable answer would be focusing upon you and me and what we must do. 
the rites and rituals and religious observances of a man, putting sin to death and all those things, putting on righteousness, which are all very important, of course. But Paul says the real mystery of godliness has got nothing to do with you, nothing to do with what you do. It's got everything to do with, the, with, with, with what Christ has done. That's the mystery of godliness, not something that man does. If you've got six steps to being a godly, fruitful church, but he roots it all in these six great historical moments of what Christ has done. Manifest in the flesh, vindicated by the Spirit as he's rising from the dead on the third day, seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed on in the world, and taken up in glory. The secret lies in him and not in us. And Paul says he's concerned. He's concerned that the church forget this great priority. He sees an, an enemy at work behind the scenes, then and now, an enemy with four, six thousand years of experience, an enemy who persuaded Adam and Eve in their state of innocence to exchange paradise for an apple by spreading doubt, doubt the truth of God's word. Doubt the reality of God's judgment, you'll not surely die. Doubt the goodness of God's heart. You know, God knows that if you eat this tree, you'll become like him, knowing good and evil. He attacks weakness, the weakness of the lady and the weakness of the leader, and he sweetens sin. He makes sin look good. He's a master of making the darkness look bright. And this enemy at work behind the scenes, trying to upend the pillar of truth, Bring the truth of God's gospel down to the ground. And he has a, a three-step method for doing that. Deception, distraction, destruction. Deception. The Spirit expressly says that in the latter times, some will depart from the faith by devoting themselves to what? To deceitful spirits and teaching of demons through the insincerity of liars whose consciences are seared to forbid marriage. Deception. The devil behind the scenes deceiving people, encouraging them to defile their conscience and make shipwreck of their souls. As Paul said to Timothy in the first chapter, Timothy, my son, keep faith and a good conscience, which some have forsaken and made shipwreck of their souls. How are your consciences, my brothers and sisters, this evening? When you say with the Apostle Paul, I, I endeavor to keep a conscience void of offense before God and before men. Deception. And then distraction. Distraction through worldly philosophies and a worldly focus. Worldly philosophies. They forbid marriage, verse 3, and require abstinence from foods that God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. For everything created by God is good, and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving, for it's made holy by the word of God in prayer. It's a worldly philosophy. And again, it's a half-truth, told as a whole truth, a half-truth. Your body causes so much trouble. Your sexual urges, your sensual desires for food and drink and so forth and so on causes so much trouble. Half-truth. Deny them altogether. Don't get married. Stop drinking any alcohol. Lay aside all the food and so forth and go into rigorous fastings, which Paul says elsewhere, as if no value for destroying the flesh. What matters, the body 
is, is the problem and bodily discipline is the answer. Worldly philosophy and a worldly focus. A focus upon men and not upon God. A focus upon time and not upon eternity. Paul says in verse 7, have nothing to do with irreverent silly myths. Rather, train yourself for godliness, for while bodily training is of some value, godliness is of value in every way, as it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. People often think Paul's speaking about working out there. I mean, don't do CrossFit. Do the cross. <laughs> Leave the fit to those crazy people. Um, but he's not speaking about bodily exercise, I think, so much as the bodily discipline of people who are denying marriage and, and, and going down the fasting route as the way of salvation. And Paul says there's some benefit to self-denial in times of fasting. Read 1 Corinthians 7, even from sex and so forth and so on. But he says that religion only has benefit in this world. Whereas godliness, soul discipline, has benefit in this world and in the world to come. And these worldly focuses and these worldly philosophies, they focus on men, not on God, and on time, not on eternity. And that's always the way. So think about it. Think of the Be Woke movement. It's a half-truth. Human injustice is bad. But tell that as a whole truth, and it becomes a whole untruth. Because there's something worse than human injustice. What's the great threat this world is facing this evening? Is it a little brief injustice from men? Is it that you or I would get what we don't deserve from man? Or is it that you and I would get what we do deserve from God? Focus on man and on time when our focus should be on God and on eternity. And every single buffeting, false, distracting notion the church faces is that way. Think of the church growth movement, the worship wars. We want people to come to church, they say. Churches grow. Half truth, healthy churches grow. Embers truthfully. That's a whole truth. But the half truth, <laughs> churches grow, right? We want people to come to church, half truth. But I'm actually much more concerned that God comes to church. Wouldn't it be awful if you persuaded the whole world to come to church? And that church was the kind of church God never darkened the door of. And so what do you do? Well, Starbucks had a difficult few years you know, encouraging people to exchange $5 for a cup of black coffee. And so what do they do? They go to the market street of the world and they say to them, what do we do? And the world says, identify your customer and give him what he wants because the customer is always right. Half truth. But the problem, of course, is when, when the main street of America identifies its customer, it only knows how to look down. But when the church identifies its customer, who is always right, we look up. Because the consumer of worship is not man, but God. Half-truths, told us whole-truths, has become whole untruths. Distraction through deception, and in the end, destruction. Paul says to Titus, don't allow yourself to get distracted. Distracted from what you are supposed to be doing, a faithful public ministry. Distracted from who you are to be, a faithful public minister. And distracted from what you are to say, a faithful preached word. And Paul says, salvation and destruction hang in the balance. Keep a close watch on yourself and on the teaching. Persist in this. 
And this is again so counterpredictable. For by so doing, you will save yourself. No. For by so doing, you will save both yourself and your hearers. It's an amazing statement. That in, in, in a sense, without in any way denying the electing, sovereign mercy of God, that if you don't keep yourself and your teaching... If you get distracted from those two fundamental priorities of a man or woman of God, your soul's on the line. And the soul of every man, woman, boy, and girl who hears you is on the line as well. And the God who, the, the God who says that also said to Gen, remember Abraham, for this reason I have chosen him that he may command his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing righteousness and holiness. Why? So that the Lord may bring upon Abraham all that he has promised him. That's an amazing statement. The coming of Jesus depends upon Abraham and Abraham working out his salvation with fear and trembling. But of course, it's not in doubt because Abraham is working out what the Lord is working in. But sometimes we don't feel God working out. He's always doing it. Even the response of grace, the, the ability to respond of, to grace is a gift of grace, right? We don't, we, but we don't often feel that. Sometimes we are just aware of crying out to God for grace. We don't feel anything happening. But we just say no. As one of my elders back in Northern Ireland in Derek Thomas's church back in Strandmillis, Ernest Brown, Ernest by name, Ernest by nature, Love Ernest. Taught himself Greek as an elder in the church to be a better Sunday school teacher. Amazing scholar. But he's the kind of man who always wore a jacket and tie and shirt, even cutting the grass. I think he took his jacket off, but tie stayed on. <laughs> he heard about Lloyd-Jones on vacation in Greece under a parasol reading John Murray and in a black suit, black hat, and so forth. He went, oh, my kind of man. <laughs> well, he was asked by the youth group at church one time, um, you know, Teenagers, full of hormones. What would be your advice, Mr. Brown, for a young couple struggling, not married, with the physical side of their relationship? And Ernest said, stop it. <laughs> there's, a lot, there's a lot more I'd want to say, right? But sometimes sanctification is as basic as that. Like in Haggai, you're focusing on your house, not God. Get an axe, go up that hill, cut down that tree, and come down and build the temple. Sometimes repentance can be as practical as that. And that only happens as God works in. But it also only happens whenever you work out your faith, your, your, your salvation with fear and trembling. And the devil's at work. Distraction or deception, distraction and destruction is his end game. He promised Adam and Eve. The devil always promises more than he can deliver. He promised Adam and Eve, you'll be like God. But they already were like God. God made them a little lower than the angels. And sin left them little better than the devil's, Thomas Watson said, which was the devil's end game all along. The devil never wants to give you. He wants to take everything from you. Remember that when he's tempting you to exchange your soul for the world and Christ for the passing pleasures of sin. So the church is the, the, the pillar of truth. As the church manifests a, a godly life. As Paul said to the woman in Titus, remember the older woman teach the younger woman to love their husbands, to love their children, to be sensible, pure, workers at home, kind, being subject to your own husbands so that the word of God will not be dishonored. That if the woman of the church, young and old, the, the men of the church, young and old, fall away from the basic ABC characteristics of godliness. The word of God is dishonored. The pillar crumbles and collapses, and the truth is no longer placarded before the world, but becomes the laughing stock of the world. 
And so I want to turn with you this evening now in the remainder of our time and look with you at Ephesians 4. I'm going to come back to Timothy Gowling at the end. Because we live in an age that is constantly clamoring The thought of being a preacher, being interviewed by Fox News or CNN, and having the world's ear, having a seat at the table with the with the 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 elite, and people will do almost anything for that. And the world is clamouring at us for, for, with half truths, be woke, which is Christian compassion without discernment that knows how to feed the hungry, but doesn't know how to say, he who does not work shall not eat. A lack of discernment that will allow the world to redefine justice and privilege and racism and these terms in ways that are profoundly hostile to the gospel. Or the the be safe. This is not a statement about vaccines or anti-vaccines. And bear with me. I'm a physician. I believe in vaccines. Right. It's it's important. Um, But this is this is an issue of the the be safe. The cult of safetyism says life is precious. You must protect it. Half truth. Life is precious. And you must also be willing to risk it or you'll lose it as you try to protect it. It's the mindset of one pastor back 18 months ago, a big church pastor in Atlanta, who said to the church, we're not going to meet again for public worship for, until January of 2020 because we can't guarantee your safety. And one of my elders got up the next Sunday. And as a physician, I thank God for my elders. Um, they sometimes see things much clearer than I do. As a physician, you're trained to do it, everything, everything the government says, everything the CDC says. And so that's your, my instinct is to go that way. And my elder stood up the next Sunday, even before I knew this man had said it. And he said, you know, in church, just to be clear, he said, we never meet because we guarantee your safety. We never can. And we never will. Guarantee your safety. You drive on the roads of North Carolina with teenagers. (laughs) No, we meet for worship, he said, because there are some things worth risking your safety for. And if the public worship of Almighty God is on top of that list, I don't know what is. And... Presbyterian shouldn't, shouldn't, we don't clap very often, but the congregation gave him a, a, a standing ovation. And the word went viral in the town. A church open for business. The, the, the Jesus of the cult of safetyism he would never inspire Latimer to say, Master Ridley, take courage. Today we are light a candle that'll burn for a thousand years. The cult of safetyism, Jesus would never inspire Samuel Davies preaching in the King's Chapel in London back in the 18th century when the king could still have your head cut off for a good reason, a bad reason, or no reason, even some of the federally prohibited reasons, he could chop off your head. And he's preaching and he sees King George II, was it, talking to his ladies-in-waiting in the balcony, and he's, it annoys him and he ignores it and then it happens again and he stops. And the Jesus of safetyism would say, don't say anything. Don't rock the boat. You're going to get a seat at the table. But Samuel Davies knew the real Jesus. Do you know what he said? When the lion roars, the beasts of the field tremble. When King Jesus speaks, the petty princes of the earth will be silent before him. Everyone looked at the king. (laughs) 
And the king shut up and put his head down. Our view of truth, be it the half-truth or the whole truth, will affect our view of Jesus. And to inoculate us against that, you and I, especially as ministers of the gospel, need to be an expert in two great subjects. What the world really is and what the world really needs. Look at Ephesians 4 with me. Ephesians 4, 17. Now, Paul's just been speaking about the church as a community of, of truth-tellers. He's been speaking about maturity in the church, being a matter of knowing what we believe, the unity of the faith, not the act of faith, but the content of it, the knowing who you believe to the knowledge, the experiential knowledge of the Son of God, verse 13, and knowing how to live to a mature man to measure up to the stature of your big brother, Jesus Christ, and his fullness. And he now wants to, be, to inoculate the church against the world. Because this is where we came from. And as they say in Northern Ireland, oil broth is easy warmed. Old broth is not hard to warm back up again. Um, I love America. I wouldn't go anywhere else in all the world but America. I'm, I wasn't born here, but I got here as fast as I could. <laughs> but when I go back home to Northern Ireland, the air in Northern Ireland just smells different. Sea air. And it's home. It smells normal and beautiful. And the world is like that. We grew up among these people. We used to love the darkness they live for. And so Paul says, Now this I say, and testify in the Lord that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do. It's interesting. Paul and Peter also describe the church in Israeli language. We are temples of God in the Spirit, right? Um, a royal king, a priesthood, and so forth. The church is Israel, and the world is a Gentile world. Israel has expanded into the New Covenant, but the danger of the Gentile world has not reduced Book of Hebrews, constantly talking about that. The danger, um, because the church's role in the world is the role of Ehud's dagger, to penetrate without being assimilated. The dagger went into that well-upholstered pagan, and out came all of his entrails and everything else. But the dagger penetrated but wasn't assimilated. And that was the great problem with Israel. They penetrated the world, and the world penetrated them. As Moody said, the place for the ship is in the sea, but heaven help the ship if the sea gets into it. And the place for the church is in the world, but heaven help the church if the world gets into it. And Paul says, don't walk as the Gentiles also walk. How do they walk? In the futility of their minds, they are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, due to the hardness of their heart. They've become callous and have given themselves up to sensuality, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. It's a three-step of worldliness, empty heads, hard hearts, filthy lives. But Paul here, he's giving you a window into a sin-dead soul. He's reminding the Ephesians of who they used to be, what they used to be. And it all centers around the mind. Think of the words, emptiness, in the futility, in the emptiness of their minds. Their minds are a vacuum, a void. 
of spiritual and moral wisdom. The word mind, noose here, is the faculty of thought, or it's a way of thinking about everything. What's, what's the basic problem with the world? It's the way they think. It's a way of thinking that doesn't factor God into everything. It's Laplace, the great physicist in the days of Napoleon, Laplace, who has these constants and equations named after him to this day, one of the founding fathers of physics and astronomy and mathematics. He was the first one to, to posit a black hole and the collapsing power of gravity in the universe. And you remember Napoleon asked him, well, how does God factor into your mathematics? You remember what Laplace said? Sir, I have no need of that hypothesis. This is the world. These are the people that are telling you what is wrong with man and how it can be fixed and what your ministry should be all be about. Their minds are empty. That's the essential problem. They begin their thinking without thinking about God, which is a problem. Because Solomon says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, yes, but first, knowledge. If you don't begin with God, you can't do anything. There's no way across Lessing's ugly ditch or across the Kantian divide, how things appear, how they really are. There's no way of getting across that ditch if you don't start with an omniscient, all-knowing, objective creator. And the world don't begin there, and their minds are empty. Next word, darkness. Darkened in their understanding. The faculty of their reason, understanding. The capacity to come to conclusions. If then, if this, then that. That faculty, Paul says, is profoundly broken in the world. Yes, there's common grace, but it can only do so much. You have the world, and they embark on their search for meaning and purpose and identity and human dignity by turning away from God and walking out into the darkness. The poor, poor, poor people, they're like blind men in a dark room looking for a black cat that isn't really there. Ignorance. They're darkened in their understanding alienated from the life of God, we'll come back to that in a second, because of the ignorance that is in them. Their spiritual know nothing, just like what Reagan said about the leftists. It's not that they're wrong, they just know so many things that ain't so. Their, their, their mental map for living life is completely wrong. They're like people driving through San Francisco with a map of downtown Greensboro. Everything's the wrong size and shape. They're like a musician trying to play Wagner's Wedding March, but they only have the music for ACDC's Highway to Hell. <laughs> the mind. Emptiness, darkness, ignorance. They are alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them. This ignorance, so emptiness, darkness, produces lifelessness. They're cut off from the life-giving presence of the living God. They're dead souls and dying bodies. Man in the beginning was a living soul in a living body, and then he became a dead soul in a dying body. Our bodies are dying because, in the world at least, our bodies are catching up with our soul. Just like when I was in Savannah, I had this, we lived in a small lot, and it was just big enough for a blower, but not quite, an electric blower. 
So I had a 50, I forget, maybe 100 foot, I forget, extension lead, and I would, I would attach it into the garage, and I would walk out with the, with the blower, and I would blow the leaves, and it would get to the bit where it was like, and there's just a little bit more grass. And I'm going, okay, boom, pull. And predictably, the moment the lead leaves the wall, the blower begins to die. And that's the world. That's man in sin. He's been disconnected from the life-giving presence of the living God. And his soul is dead. Dead. That's really hard for people to factor. How can I be a dead soul walking about? Well, think about it. If I had a heart attack now and died, my body wouldn't cease to exist. It just would cease to have the life God intended it to have. The hands wouldn't be moving. The lips wouldn't be speaking. The eyes wouldn't be looking. Lungs wouldn't be breathing. Heart wouldn't be beating. Well, a dead soul like that is there. It exists, but it doesn't have the life God intended it to have. God reveals his glory in the sunset. And the living and the dead soul goes, ah, I can see nothing special. God speaks to him, and he hears nothing. God pokes him, like your arm when it's dead over the end of the couch when you fall asleep watching a late night movie, and you wake up and the arm's across your face, and you, <gasps> you kind of, oh, and it's, you know, it's my arm, but it's dead. I can't feel it. It's dead. And the dead soul is there, but it's no life. This is the world. Like the legs of a dead cockroach, all of their thoughts, desires, and intentions point into themselves, not up to God. I never like using movies and illustrations, but I was at a seminary, one of my compatriots preached this sermon in Romans 6 from the sixth sense. I've never seen the movie. I think it's about it's Bruce Willis in it, and I think there's a little child who can see dead people. But what I, the only thing I remember was his sermon. It was amazing. He said, he quoted the movie, I see dead people everywhere. They don't even know they're dead. They only see what they want to see. This is the world, emptiness, darkness, lifelessness, and then hardness. They are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardness of their heart. You ask the typical atheist, why don't you believe in God? Like Bertrand Russell was asked, the famous atheist was asked, if you die and you go to heaven, when well, you stand at the gates of heaven, not be too optimistic. You stand at the gates of heaven and God says to you, why didn't you believe in me? Remember Burton Russell's famous answer, not enough evidence. Man's a liar. Stephen Charnock, every plant, every atom, as well as every star, at the first meeting, whispers this in our ears. I have a creator. I am a witness to deity. Or Saitem Brueggen kid, I love this quote. Evidence for God, I have a pump in my chest made of meat the size of my fist that pumps 600,000 gallons of blood a year and runs on donuts and you want evidence for God? <laughs> Tremendous faith. And the problem with atheism, Paul says, the world, it's not evidence outside the mind. It's enmity inside the mind. As Peter Kreef said, commenting on Blaise Pascal's pensée, that atheism is an attitude much more than an argument. Men despise religion, he says. They hate it and are afraid it may be true. The root of most atheism is not argument but attitude, not intellection but feeling, not the love of the truth but the fear of it. Or Gehirdus Voss, Gehirdus Voss, sorry. By nature, Total depravity means that no love for God is present as the motivating principle of our life, that it does not dwell in us as a disposition and therefore never determines our deeds, thoughts, and words, and conversely that in our entire life there is an undertow of hostility toward God. 
That's just brilliant. In our entire life, there is an undertow of hostility toward God that only needs an external stimulus to develop into conscious opposition toward the Lord. You know, the reason why the wicked don't believe is because they won't believe, and it's because they won't believe that they can't believe. The hardness, which leads to filthiness. They give themselves over to sensuality, trying to desperately grasping for some satisfaction anywhere, which is normally sexual and sensual. And these are the people that the Wookie McWook Brigade want you and me to listen to when it comes to diagnosing the world's problems. And Paul says you must understand what the world is, a place of emptiness, a place of darkness, a place of lifelessness, and a place of hardness. But you also must understand what the world really needs. What made the difference? And notice, the pagan problem begins in the mind, and so does the answer. Verse 20, but that is not the way you learned Christ. And the ESV completely messes up the next verse. Assuming that you have heard, not about him, assuming that you have heard him and were taught in him, just as truth is in Jesus, that here is the, here's the power of the Christian message. It's not me preaching. It's not Rick preaching. It's not Harry preaching. It's Christ preaching. That Christ comes down and audibly addresses the church through us. We are little men with little voices. And we speak with the voice of a man. But we aren't the only ones speaking. Christ is speaking. He's addressing the hearers audibly and rationally. This is not the way you learned Christ. Assuming that you have heard him and were taught in him. As we come into union with Christ, as we believe into him, and that eternal union that God set up before the foundation of the world, where, Christ, where he is we and we are he, the, the foundation of atonement, that, that our sins can become legally his liability and his righteousness can become legally our legacy because we become one in the covenantal mind and purposes and electing grace of God. And so in, on the cross, Jesus can say, Father, my sins are more in number than the hairs of my head. Can you say, the Lord is my righteousness? And Jesus can say, you are my sin. His just, your, his condemnation is as real legally as your justification is real. His sin, your sins became his just as much and as surely as his righteousness becomes yours. But not just that, his mind becomes yours too as you believe into him. As the word is preached among the, in the church, the, as, we, as we experience that union with Christ on the Lord's day, his mind becomes ours, his wisdom becomes ours, and we are taught in him just as truth is in Jesus. That the truth of the Christian message isn't a word about God. It is God the Son Himself. It's personal. Jesus says, I am the way and the truth and the life. The way is a person. The truth is a person. The life is a person. A person to trust, to know, to love, to be loved by. And that dynamic of sanctification that this truth comes and it lays hold of you and me to put off your old self which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires. Literally, that is being corrupted by the lies that lust tells. So the old man is being whispered to by his lusts and is corrupting him. 
and leading him further and further away from God. But sanctification is the opposite direction. As we put off that old man and we put on a new man, being renewed in the spirit of our minds, as the fullness of Christ fills the emptiness of the worldly mind. And we put on a new self, created after the likeness of God. And again, ESV drops the ball. In righteousness and holiness, which comes from the truth, it's the lie of the lust that deceives us and corrupts us. It's the truth of Christ that transforms us from darkness to light and recreates us into the image of God in knowledge, right reason, righteousness, right living, and holiness, right relationship with God. Now, let me bring this all to conclusion. What the world really is, emptiness, darkness, lifelessness, hardness, filthiness, what the world really needs, Christ. Brothers and sisters, especially those of us preaching the truth, we've got to center our hearts and center our ministries on the truth of Christ or we'll be torn to shreds by the centripetal, sorry, centrifugal forces of the world. We've got to be locked in Christ because if, our, if we have a half a truth as a gospel, we'll have half a savior to offer, which is no savior. And I want to encourage you to devote yourself to the great work of preaching men. It's, the, it's what Martin Lloyd-Jones called the romance of preaching, that we're speaking, but we're not the only ones speaking. There's the voice of man, and there's the voice of God. Our voice is a barely audible puff of snow falling onto powdered snow on the mountain somewhere. If it was just us speaking, it'd be madness, like walking into a graveyard and asking the dead to rise. They'd lock you up or take you to a dark room to lie down until you recovered your senses. What we try to do in the Lord's day is madness if it was just us speaking. But his voice is also speaking. He is the hammer that smashes the rock in pieces. As Paul said in Titus 1, that he manifested in his own time his word in the thing preached. Now, I'm not a Bartian. I was interviewing a student for the ministry as part of our presbytery's examining committee. And one of the examiners, I have to say, failed his exam the year before in First Presbytery. How he got on the committee is another thing. But he asked the student, okay, so a man is coming to, <laughs> coming to the Bible and um, he reads it in church, does nothing to him at all, goes home, reads the same passage, and it suddenly comes alive and he's converted. When did it become the Word of God? And the student, thanks be to God, said correctly, it never became the Word of God, it always was the Word of God. And the examiner went, no, no. It became the Word of God in the man's, and I said, excuse me a second, this is very embarrassing. <laughs> Can I ask the student just to stop it? Sir, have you ever heard of Karl Barth? And he went, no. And I said, that's good, because my next question was, do you like him? <laughs> what a fruitful discussion. I'm not a Barth, right? But either is Paul. But Paul is saying here that, that when, when the word is preached, it's not that you get a better Bible, but you get the Bible better. It's like water hidden in hot air that rises up and you can't see it or feel it. And then it meets cold air and suddenly it condenses and the clouds appear. And likewise, Paul says that God manifests his word in the message preached. It's as if the word of God becomes palpable and visible and feelable. It's not a word, but it'll do in the meantime. As the word is going forth, and you know what that's like, don't you, men? His word is like the hammer that smashes the rock in pieces. The voice is the Lord, that's powerful, that shakes the wilderness, that breaks the cedars in pieces. Makes Lebanon skip like a calf. And that's all true when the word is just read, but it's especially true, the confession says, when it's preached. And the Bible honors both of those things. Remember as Paul says in 1 Corinthians 14, if an unbeliever comes into your service and an ungifted man comes, 
He, he is convicted by all. He is called to account by all. That's amazing. He's exposed. He's shown up for what he really is by all the ones prophesying. He is called to account. He doesn't say God calls him to account, but we call him to account. Then in the next verse, it says, The secrets of his heart are disclosed, and so he will fall on his face and worship God, declaring that God is certainly among you. That the word is preaching, and I'm speaking, and Harry's speaking, and Rick's speaking, and you're speaking, and your churches. But you're not the only one speaking, and God's people are there. And suddenly it's as if you disappear, and behind you there's one like the Son of Man standing, clothed in the sun, with his eyes shining like blazing flames of fire, and people feel their hearts being exposed. The Lord's searching me and knowing me, understanding my thoughts from afar, scrutinizing my path and my lying down. His words living and active, sharp, like a two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirits, discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. There's no creature hidden from his sight, and God is there. And you've experienced that, haven't you? There's the human side in Acts 14.1. In Iconium, they entered the synagogue of the Jews together, and spoke in such a manner that a large number of people believed, both of Jews and of Gentiles. Then there's the divine side. In the previous chapter, when the Gentiles heard this, they began rejoicing and glorifying the word of God. As many as had been appointed to eternal life believed. And I want to finish here this evening. I have more to say, but time's up. There's God's work. As many as were appointed to eternal life believed. And there's our work. They spoke in such a way that many people believed. And sometimes a kind of cold, barren, twisted hyper-Calvinism comes across Reformed preachers. And they think to themselves, moving the hearts of men is God's job, not mine. That's a half-truth. But if it's told like a whole truth... It becomes a whole untruth. One student said to John Angel James, God doesn't need my learning. And Angel James said, He is still less of a need of your ignorance. (laughs) And man, God doesn't need your earnestness, but He has still less of a need of your coldness. And men, painted fires don't burn. In a cold, dark room, a painted fire is worse than nothing. Because it presents to me, the cold man, what needs to be there, but is what is so painfully missing. And worse, it makes me doubt the reality of heat at all because a painted fire doesn't burn. I wonder, does he believe what he is saying? Can I believe what he is saying? Is there anything there to be believed at all? Brothers, I'm tired of hearing myself, and I'm tired of hearing a lot of other Reformed preachers speaking of the glories of Christ like a vegan trying to describe the glory of a medium-rare ribeye steak. Are we blind men who have never seen the light of the sun? Are we lepers who have never come before Jesus and said, if you're willing, you can cleanse me and to feel his hand, his clean hand touch us while we're still dirty. And the little boy cried out, 
I mean, I thought if you touch a leper, you become a leper. Are we orphans who've never run home to the Father and seen him run out to us and wrap us in his arms? Are we sinners who'd thought we'd sinned away the last hope of mercy and Christ never came to us and wrapped his arms around us and said, I'll never cast you out? Or sin abounds, grace does much more abound. Have we, have we never been walking to sin, thinking, when sin abounds, grace does much more abound, and Jesus comes, he's not the nice Jesus, but the good Jesus, and says, remember Lot's wife. Do you love Jesus? He's, he's kind enough to say, where sin abounds, grace is much more abound. But some men preach the gospel as if that's the only word he has. But he also says, those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Remember Lot's wife. And if your doctrine of sanctification and justification doesn't have room for both those verses, your doctrine of justification and sanctification is too small. You need both of them. Are we Davids who have never had the devilish Absalom come and take everything away and walking out or maybe away from a ministry feeling I've, I've messed it all up and people are saying there is no deliverance for him in God and then suddenly the Holy Spirit brings to your mind Psalm 3 but you O Lord are a shield about me my glory and the one who lifts up my head. And brothers, the world needs Christ, and our people do. Not a cold Christ, not an analytical Christ, not a Christ like Buddha smiling with his kind of faint smile, playing on his lips, but the real Christ, the whole Christ. One that we feel. I was reading John Angel James in Ernest Ministry just recently. And remember that line in it when the, he talks about this Anglican minister, you know the kind of effeminate, sing song, your voice, we're gathered here to worship God this morning. It's all lovely. And Very nice. And he said to the actor once, I don't understand it at all. He said, you speak of fictions and people leave your plays. Weeping. I speak of realities. People leave my church service unmoved. Why is that? And the actor said, well, the answer's easy. Because I speak of fictions as if they were realities. Whereas you speak of realities as if they were fictions. And men, as we enter a, perhaps a new dark age, when we face down a, a, an increasingly hostile government and tyrannical forces in our culture, Our people need the power of a felt Christ. As John Owen said, would to God that I ever preach an unfelt Christ. If we don't feel it, how will our people feel it? It might happen despite us, but it will not happen because of us. Would to God that he would raise up a fresh generation of preachers, beginning with me, men, of blazing hearts, with Calvin, lifting them heavenward, sincerely and promptly, sincerely and promptly, O Lord, my heart I give to thee. And we might preach, not as painted fires, but man, men on fire, with the power and presence of God. It's the antidote. Without it, the church will never, ever be that glorious pillar of truth placarding the gospel to a dying world that desperately needs it. 
And Jesus says, wherever you are this evening, come to me. Don't allow the pressures of ministry. I, I have to confess, I have recently, it's been so busy at church, we've said so many people coming, it's been just overwhelming. And we're trying to hire a new pastor, I'm by myself, and I'm exhausted, and I've allowed the pressure of ministry, ministering for God to move my soul just a little bit toward the edge. And not spending unhurried time in the presence of the master. How can we minister for the master if we don't? Aren't spending time with the master. And it's appallingly, it's appalling men how well we can preach. With our souls drifting just a little bit far away from Jesus. Ravi Zacharias haunts me. I was in my, my, my bedroom this afternoon. I felt like Samson. I said, Lord, Have mercy. Help me get my priorities straight that I might spend time with you. Or I'll have no words to speak for you, at least not real words that blaze in the reality of a man who's been in the presence of Jesus. Let's pray together. Oh Lord Jesus, you're good and you're merciful and you're true. And without you, we are nothing. I have no wisdom of my own, no strength of my own, no power of my own, no message of my own. None of us have. And we pray, O oh Lord, that you would come in your glory and fill us up. Help us to preach as dying men to, to dying men, as those who are never sure to speak again with the word eternity strapped on our hearts and minds. Eternity. That our focus will be upon you and not upon man and upon eternity and not just upon time. And we offer these prayers, O Lord, that in our ministry and through our efforts, your word will spread rapidly and be glorified. And Christ will see the travail of his soul and be satisfied. Amen.